that I'm speaking of a 12-year-old boy, not some grown-up who's had time to ripen naturally evil disposition. At least in 1932, Ard was 12 and I was 7, when we were both second kids attending the small town school in rural Alabama. Ard had failed the first grade twice and was now serving his second term in the second grade. This sorry record wasn't due to dumbness. Ard was intelligent. Cunning is a better word, but he took after the rest of his... <coughs> the whole family. There were ten of them, not counting Dad Henderson, who was a bootlegger and usually in jail, all scrunched together in a four-room house next door to the Negro church. The whole family was a shiftless surly bunch. Every one of them ready to do you a bad turn. Odd <coughs> wasn't the worst of the lot. Brother, that's saying something. Most of the children in our school came from families poor than the Hendersons. Odd had a pair of shoes, while some boys, girls too, were forced to walk barefoot through the bitterest weather. That's how hard the depression hit our baby. But nobody, I don't care who looked as down and out as all. You might have felt pity for him. If he hadn't been so hateful, all the kids feared him. Not just us younger kids, but even boys his old age and older. Nobody ever picked a fight with Lord. Except one time, a girl named Ann Finchberg. Jumbo Finchberg. Jumbo Finchberg. <laughs> who happened to be the other town boy. Jumbo was solid, but solid tomboy with no hell left his wrestling technique. Jumped out from behind her and recess one little morning, and he took <laughs> three teachers, each of whom seemed to wish the combatants would kill each other. <laughs> A good long while to separate them. The result was sort of a draw. Jumbo lost a tooth and half her hair and developed a gray cloud in her left eye. She could never see clear again. Odd afflictions included a broken thumb, plus scratch guards that will stay with him till the day they shut his coffin. For months afterward, Odd played every kind of trick to go Jumbo into a rematch, but Jumbo had gotten her licks and gave Odd considerable work. Is Odd done if he let me? Alas, I was the object of Odd's relentless attention. Aside from all, I was fairly well off considering the era and locale, living as I did in a high-ceilinged old country house situated where the town ended and the farms and forests began. The house belonged to elderly cousins, distant relatives, and these cousins. Three maiden ladies and their bachelor brother. Had taken me under their roof because of a disturbance among my more immediate family. A custody battle that, for and of all reasons, had left me stranded with this somewhat eccentric Alabama household. Not that I was unhappy here. My mother, who was exceptionally intelligent, was the most beautiful girl in Alabama. Everyone said so, and it was true. But when she was 16, she had a 28-year-old businessman from a good New Orleans family. The marriage lasted a year. My mother was too young to be a mother or a wife. She was also too ambitious. She wanted to go to school and have a career. When she went to school, she made a success of herself in New York. Both would walk the marriage path again. In fact, my father walked it six times. <laughs> I'm happy here. Indeed, moments of those few years turned out to be the better part of an otherwise difficult childhood. Mainly because the youngest of my cousins, a woman in her sixties, became my first friend. As she was a child herself, she understood children and understood me absolutely. Perhaps it was strange for a young boy to have as his best friend an aging spinster, but neither of us had ordinary outlooks or backgrounds, and so it was inevitable in our separate loneliness that we should come to share a friendship apart. Except for the hours I spent at school, the three of us were almost always together. Me, Miss Sook, is everyone called my friend, and our Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier. Who survived his temper and two rattlesnake bites. We hunted herbs in the woods and went fishing on the remote creeks. We tried to share cane stalks as fishing poles. We hunted curious ferns and greeneries. Miss Sook, sensitive as shy lady fern, a recluse who had rarely traveled beyond the county boundaries, was totally unlike her brothers and sisters, vaguely masculine ladies. Who operated a dry goods store and several other business ventures. When I came home from school, she was always eager to keep my company, to play a card game named Brooke, or rush up on a mushroom hunt, or have a pillow fight. Or, as we sat in the kitchen's waning afternoon light, help me with my homework. She loved to pour over my textbooks. The geometry apples especially. Oh, buddy, she calls me buddy, and 
memory of a boy who was formerly her best friend. The other body died in the 1890s when she was still a child. She is still a child. Oh, buddy, just think of it. I like that titty cockle that really exists somewhere in the world. <laughs> My education was her education as well. Because she had been sickly as a child, she had almost no schooling. Her handwriting was a series of jagged eruptions. Her spelling, a highly personal and phonetic affair. I can already read and write with smoother assurance. She managed to study one Bible chapter every night and never missed Little Orphan Annie or the Cats and Jammer Kids, comics carried by the mobile paper. She also took a bristling pride in our report card. Gosh, buddy, five A's, even arithmetic. I didn't dare hope we'd get an A in arithmetic. <laughs> It was a mystery to her why I hated school. While some ones I went and pleaded with Uncle B, but decided to go to the house. to stay home? Of course, it wasn't that I hated school. What I hated was all the Henderson, the torments he contrived. <coughs> for instance, he used to wait for me under a water oak that darkened the edge of the school grounds. In his hand, he held the stack, sack stuffed with privileged copperbirds collected on his way to school. There was no sense in trying to run. He was as quick as a coiled snake. Like a rattler, he struck, slammed me to the ground, and his slitty eyes gleeful would rub the birds into my scalp. <laughs> Usually a circle of kids came around to titter, or pretend to. They didn't really think it funny, but all made them nervous enough and ready to plead. Hiding in the toilet in the boys' room, I would untangle the birds not in my hair. Our second grade teacher, Miss Armstrong, was sympathetic, for she suspected what was happening, though finally enraged by my continual tardiness, she raved at me in front of the whole class. Little Mr. Babebridges, what a big head he has, waltzing in here 20 minutes after the bell, a half hour. Yell at him, he's the one to blame the the son of a bitch! I knew a lot of curse words. <laughs> Yet even I was surprised that when I heard what I said resounding in an awful silence. Hold out your hands, sir. Palms up, sir. It would take a page in small print to list the imaginative punishments all inflicted. But I heard what I suffered from and resented most was a sense of dour expectations he induced. Once, when he had me pinned against the wall, I asked him straight out. What have I done to make you dislike me so much? Yo, sissy, I'm just straightening you out, that's all. He was right. I was a sissy of sorts. And the moment he said it, I knew there was nothing I could do to alter his judgment, other than accept and defend the fact. But once I regained <coughs> a piece of the warm kitchen, where Queen was gone and all dug up gold, or my friend pondering with a pie crust, the weight of our Henderson would bless him to slide to my shoulder. <coughs> but too often at night, Ard's narrow line eyes loomed in my dreams while his high, harsh voice pronounced cruel promises in my ears. <coughs> my friend's bedroom was next to mine. Occasionally, cries arising from my midnight upheavals wakened her. And she would come into my room and shake me from an odd Henderson coma. Look, you've even scared Queen. She's shaking. Is it a fever? Oh, you're bringing wet. Maybe we ought to call Dr. Stone. Well, she knew it wasn't the fever. She knew it was because of my troubles at school. All on the picks on me out of jealousy. He's not smart and pretty as you are. The thing to keep in mind, buddy, is this boy can't help acting ugly. He doesn't know any better. And you can lay that at Dad Henderson's door. Best thing that ever happened when they locked him up at State Farm. Poor Molly Henderson. Not a dime to a name or a tooth in her head. And so many children to feed. You've got to take everything into account, buddy. Be patient. 